Morning folks, it's lovely to be back in Australia. I was here in uh, 1995. Uh, I was a forester by trade, a country boy from the south of England, um, spent 10 years in forestry uh, and then I got a little bit bored at Forestry College because there was lots of academic work and I came out into Victoria to fight bushfires for a season so that was uh, a nice break for me. Uh, and then when I went back I joined the Fire and Rescue Service in Hampshire, again down in the south of England. And it was really I guess my agricultural background that has led to uh, the position that we're in now along with a colleague of mine uh, who was in a similar position. So Rebecca has already sort of explained animal rescue and, and uh, how things have developed over the last few years and I think uh, any of you having difficulty with your managers uh, just invite Rebecca along. I think um, she would be a formidable opponent if they were trying to stand up to this. Um, but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we've developed and how things have moved forward in the UK and as Chris said how we may be able to share our ideas with you. Um, We've all been doing animal rescue for a long, long time. I think that's really important to say. Uh, and as Rebecca alluded to, we've all been um, having a go. People have got different experiences. People have adapted, and I call it winging it. Um, but people have adapted their skills. And there were people doing things around the country, perhaps, that we all needed to know about. Things that weren't written down, things that weren't communicated, but were good practice. There was also quite a lot of bad practice as well, which we needed to sift our way through. So, you know, in the early 1990s, um, it was actually my father who was on a, it was a whole time firefighter uh, with a rescue tender. They went out to a horse and a cattle grid and uh, they turned up with all the cutting gear and great expertise in road traffic incidents. They tried to cut this horse out of the cattle grid. It just basically panicked and self-destructed and had to be put down and they went away from that feeling a bit sheepish and thinking, what can we do to be better prepared? What can we do as professionals, professional rescuers to do this job better? This is a cracking photo. This has really been a useful aid to us to highlight some of the dangers um, to firefighters. And uh, I could spend 45 minutes just talking around this picture alone. There's so much that you can get out of this picture. But lack of knowledge will lead to dangerous situations for not just firefighters, but vets and the public and the animal. You know, so it really is important that we have the knowledge base to be able to make informed decisions uh, about the tactical plan. If you take nothing else away from this conference, right, as firefighters, SES, other emergency responders, I want you to see this, not as Mrs. Scrunchbucket's pet, <laughs> I want you to see this in terms of a hazmat incident, as Mark's already alluded to. I mean, we could go home now, because Mark's got it. I mean, he's, he's already, you know, he could go away and start this now. Because that animal comes with a brain, and it comes with a history, and it comes with an owner. And all those things add up to provide us with a variety of challenges which need to be sorted out. Um, so as a fire rescue service member, when I go out to a hazardous material of any other description, then there will be emergency action details for me to gather information, to make informed decisions, very quick decisions on initial emergency actions, and then we can gather far greater in-depth information about that product and what we need to do to contain it and to, uh, to sort that situation out. But when it comes to the horse, when it comes to the livestock transporter, there's no placarding, there's no tr uh, transport emergency details that come with it. You've got a frantic owner and we need to be able to use our knowledge and our intuition and our experience to make the right decisions to do the best for everybody. Now, <coughs> When I'm talking to firefighters that haven't had any training, I would say that a large animal to an untrained crew is an unpredictable hazardous material. All right? So a large animal to an untrained crew is an unpredictable hazardous material. When we've had some training, we can quite safely say that it is now a predictably unpredictable hazardous material. All right? So it's not as if you can say, I'll do X and Y will happen. And we as Fire and Rescue Service members like to be very prescriptive and procedural about things. We like to be able to know that if you, take, if you carry out that drill by, by numbers to the letter, that's the outcome that you will have. This is a very fluid type of situation that we're dealing with uh, and again one that needs a lot of skill. But Rebecca touched on the, the key principles of instant command earlier. Instant command at these rescues is so, so important. We bring instant command to the table. We can learn rescue techniques. 
We can learn from our veterinary colleagues. We can learn animal handling and psychology. Instant command is what we do well, and we need that to be able to control people that perhaps don't have those skills uh, in rescue. And uh, here's a, a classic example of a horse in a ditch, everyday common all garden scenario for us in Hampshire. Here's the vet. She's about to give it some analgesia. She's not sedating it. She's giving it pain relief. And, um, you know, these firefighters that are there don't have any idea. They've got the right PPE for water rescue. They've got airbags for rescue, for, you know, for other, other rescue types. Um, but what they haven't got is a knowledge of this animal. They don't understand the psychological effects of being around that prey animal and putting it under that much pressure. Um, this rescue went on for about three hours, and as Rebecca said earlier, this would be a 20-minute job. Vetting, triage, plan A, job done. Cameraman's gone to sleep at this point. Uh, this is the instant commander, this young lady here. Firstly, there's no tabard, so who, who from an outside agency would know she's in charge? Secondly, she's involved in the rescue. It's like a Chinese parliament, everyone's having their say. Now we've got members of the public getting involved in that situation because when the fire brigade traditionally turned up, we've looked to the owner, to the vet, for inspiration. They're doing exactly the reverse of any rescue. At a rescue, we make space, don't we, to bring the casualty out. We don't force casualties out through the back window of cars anymore. We make space. What they're doing is they're just loading this up with soggy uh, straw and hay. They're just making the situation more difficult to get away from if it goes wrong. This horse is displaying natural behavioural characteristics. Once it's trapped, it will thrash for a period, and then it will give up and prepare to dive. And then it will go through a whole procedure of rest and thrash, and rest and thrash, depending on the stimulation. And here's a guy stimulating this horse, and there's the owner at the back putting some hay down. Watch what happens when this reacts. She's brought in there, and she is, as she comes out, you'll see her put a hand to her head. She was kicked by her horse. We have a duty of care. If we're going to accept the job of going out and doing these, these things professionally, this is our inner cordon, this is our immediate area of risk, and now we've got a member of the public that's been injured at that job. And if that was a fire or, or any other incident and someone got injured, we'd probably be stood in court. But because it's an animal rescue, traditionally people have thought, oh, well, you know, that's really sad. But the other problem is people don't report injuries. Right. If I fell over on a drill ground, oh, there'd be forms in triplicate, you know, and then they'd probably have to cordon it off and resurface it and all that rubbish. Um, but because animals cause people to behave in a more emotional way, even firefighters that go out, if they get injured, they generally don't like to record those events because they might think that um, you know, I was a bit wimpish or they might think that they wouldn't be allowed to go out and rescue animals again if, um, you know, if they were reporting these things. So consequently, we don't have the data or didn't have the data in the past to raise this issue to the top of uh, planning agendas. Uh, as Mark was saying, it's difficult to get this concept over to, uh, to managers why we need to improve animal rescue. Well, it's because it's a hazmat job, it's a dangerous job, and if we're not equipped and prepared, we're going to get injuries. Right? And that means big problems. Um, here is, a, again, another example of... Um, this is a crew that has a bit more knowledge, or, or certainly had an animal rescue response, but didn't understand the ethos of this. Here again, we've got our member of the public. There's no egress protection for this young lady. The guys thought, we don't need a vet on scene. As long as we've got an owner there, that will calm the horse down. I think many of us have been there. I've been at jobs when this horse in this situation has gone absolutely ballistic. Right. There's no sedation in that animal. They're working on the safer side. They're working spine side, but look at the stimulation as they're doing, uh, putting the straps around. And the most difficult and challenging part of any rescue is the release, generally, because that's when that animal senses freedom, that's when you get the physical effect of the mental anxiety that you've placed on that animal by being around it and doing all these weird things to it. And here you'll see the horse, watch it, it's eating as well. It eats all the way through this. As Rebecca said, you know, leap hay before it's shot, but yeah, it's probably comfort eating here. As it's released, it thinks, I'm free. But because they don't chuck it back up in the air again quickly enough, then um, we, we've got a problem with our knitting. They haven't got head control because they've got no proper head restraint on it. They've got no chemical control. They've got no quick release element to the system that they employ. So up it goes again. We're swinging around on the crane. They think this is perfectly acceptable. 
there's no steerage, there's no proper head control. Um, it's just going through the drive through at McDonald's. You'll notice in a second it will uh, And you're all sort of sat there thinking, well, sort of what happens next? Like the question is brought, what happens next? Well, no chemical control, stressed horse, no quick release couplings, no proper head control. And you might as well stick a bucking strap around it and send it down the rodeo. Stand by. All very calm, everyone thinks it's perfectly all right until it hits terra firma. And now we've let our hazmat out of that in trap situation and brought it into the public arena and caused this effect. Look at the truck moving around. And then get away with it again. And that's the, that's the point really, is that time and time again we're getting away with it, we manage but we don't necessarily understand the risks that we put uh, firefighters into. So, what we did was we looked at, um, my, my father went away and he looked at agricultural colleges and he said, well, what can we do then to, to learn more about animal behaviour? And they said, well, we need to do handling courses to start off with. And the mantle was taken up by my colleague, uh, Anton, a few years later. Uh, like anything else in the fire brigade, you know, uh, we don't need to do that. Animal handling, what, you know, what's that all about? You know, managers weren't up for it, and it took a little while later to establish animal handling back in 1997. And this was introducing your firefighter to the large animal, because a lot of our firefighters don't come from rural backgrounds anymore. Some of them are scared stiff when they go near a horse. Well, any of you that got horses will understand that if you've got someone that's a little bit tentative around the horse, the horse will pick up on that straight away and end up mullering you. you know, so it's really important that they have confidence and we build on that over time. And it was in 2003, 2004 that my colleague, is my little short colleague Anton, uh, well he's short compared to Rebecca anyway, she picks him up, <laughs> carries him round. Um, we started looking at, well, what, what could we do? We researched around the UK to see what um, training was available, what provision, what protocols, what procedures, all the rest of it. There was nothing really in place that we could use tangibly. And so we looked further afield and we saw that Thomas and Rebecca were doing some work around disasters and, uh, and uh, animal rescue going into those um, disaster areas and, and teaching large animal rescue techniques. And we thought, yeah, this is really, really good stuff. Uh, we did a lot of research. Uh, and then we went out in 2005 and, uh, and carried out a course with Rebecca and Tomas uh, and we learned a load of stuff from them. We took some stuff out as well, I think. I think we were able we to contribute. Um, we contributed a little bit and, um, and between us now, we've, we've come up with a toolbox of techniques that are uh, in the best interest of safety and the best interests of the animals that we're there to rescue. So that was a really, really positive time. We looked at marine mammal rescue. We have courses in the UK for marine mammals because we get stranded whales and, and seals and things like that. What happens when you get a stranded whale? Everyone wants to go and cuddle it. We got a human safety issue again. And uh, we looked at the small animal side. We do a lot of small animal rescues in the UK as well. Uh, and so that was quite critical for us to understand about reptiles and exotics and raptors, that sort of thing. So, the animal rescue advisor role came about and we started going to incidents, we had a pager and we went to incidents and we were then bringing our agricultural background and our newly gained knowledge about at rescue techniques to the rescue scene to start to develop people's ideas. And by thinking about safe working, positioning, what's in the best interest of the animal, we were able to improve our safety and also we had more viable rescues as a result of it because we put in some thought into the whole situation. So here we are using um, just your neck and, um, uh, and leg uh, shepherd's crooks here for the first time. You know, they bent, so we went and got some bigger ones. Um, but we're working on the safe side. You know, we don't have harnesses in those days. We didn't do safe working at height. You know, we still used to send people out over the side of buildings with a rope that was just under your foot and just holding it and feathering it like that. And then the safe working at height people thought, oh dear. Um, and so we were starting to develop as a fire and rescue service in Hampshire, but then there was this fundamental missing element. And as Rebecca said earlier, safety is what we bring to the table. Here's uh, a local vet doing a rollover. He's rolling this, this horse over that we've got out of this clay hole. 
and uh, just look at his position in there and the sequence of photos that follows that. I mean, as it goes over the point of no return, the legs are going back and are starting to, to spring forward. He's got no protection there at all. Um, and so we really did need to engage our vets because they were a key piece of our jigsaw, but they weren't exactly on message. Uh, and even now, it, it's, it's something that we're developing in their culture, but you still get people that will come and will think, oh, well, I know best. And here we've got an example of a little uh, calf here that's been brought out of a wreck trailer on a rescue glide, and the boys are just going to carry out a rollover procedure. Now, me with a bit more experience and a bit of cattle knowledge, and I would have probably just, just pulled the sheet out, pushed it up sternally, give it a kick, and it would have been up. You know, but, you know... Firefighters that don't have that agricultural background need to rely on procedures, right? And if, if they carry out those procedures every time, then they're going to have a safe rescue and they're going to go home with their arms and legs attached. And yes, there are shortcuts, but often those shortcuts, you know, they might work 80% of the time. It's the 20% of the time when it can go wrong and you're going to get hurt. So here we are with our boys. They're just about to do something quite controlled. And uh, in comes the vet and says, no, 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 boys, you won't do it like this. Look at where his syringe is. Right, it's kicking back, then he's saying get hold of the legs to the front, the syringe in his mouth. Now if he did that, if those firefighters saw that for the first time, they might think that's the right way to do it. You know, so what we've got, we've got quite a challenging job on our hands to, to educate on both, both sides. A defining moment for us uh, was 2007. Now the Horse and Hound magazine and the British Horse Society were running a campaign in 2006 to highlight discrepancies in the response that people would get from fire services around the country. I just started um, a full-time position doing rural safety and, uh, and animal rescue and I marched into the British Horse Society and said, oh, I wondered if you can help us. And they said, oh, no, 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 you come and help me. And I wrote... Uh, the, the, the emergency perspective for this document, which is the emergency services protocol. And that was designed as a sort of an opening gambit to send out to all control rooms and to, to different rescue services to say, well, here's some key principles when you're dealing with large animals. And I was asked to speak at the launch uh, of this protocol, and um, I speak at lots of little, you know, sort of, um, Brockenhurst Parish Council and people like that, and then they said, oh, were you available on the 14th of uh, May? And I said, well, yeah, where is it going to be? Thinking it was at Oxfordshire Town Hall or something. Oh, Buckingham Palace. So, oh, goodness. So Anton and I, this is Anton and, and I, uh, were here with Princess Anne. We're telling her all about the rescue initiative, and she's really interested because she loves horses, and she'd walk over any of us to rescue her horse. Um, and uh, this guy here, who you're going to hear from tomorrow, is Professor Josh Slater, and he's the Professor of Equine Clinical Studies at the Royal Veterinary College uh, near London. And uh, he was in the president of the British Equine Vets Association at the time, and that was the light bulb moment for him, because he then realised that vets were fundamental to a rescue, but do vets have any training at veterinary college? No. Do they have any rescue training? No. Do they have any large animal trauma training? No. So when I've gone out to my, my job, and I'm sure you've all done so before, and you say, right, Mr. Vet, what are we going to do? He's winging it as well. All right, that's the important thing to remember. Yeah, so he's using his experience or her experience of what they've done in the past. There's no clear guidance and principles that they're working to. So that was a good time. And then we started using that opportunity to start training vets. Uh, and we've trained probably six, 700 vets in the UK, which isn't very much, um, but it's a start. Uh, this is my fire station in the, uh, in the UK, and uh, this is some vets doing some lifting training. And then, you know, we do a mud rescue scenario at the end of it, and they all get to wear dry suits. They all perform the roles that we would as a rescue team. And the key to this was day one, when you give them an exercise to do, they're really bad at working in teams. Because they don't work in teams on a daily basis, and they're used to being in charge. Which, in an emergency situation, we all need to say, this is my role on the day. And when I get into a fire engine, one day I might be in charge, one day I might drive, one day I'll be in the back going in hard and low and face, laughing in the face of danger. Right, so that's easy for me. I can adapt and I can perform all those roles. But a vet generally is doing the same thing all the time. So when we bring them into the instant command system, they need to understand that this is their specific professional role and they have a responsibility for all our safety but by virtue of the fact of what they're doing, but they're part of a bigger picture and a team. And the vets that come on these courses, a lot of them are reassured because they now feel that they don't have to be everything to everybody and they feel they're part of a team and the team's looking after them and we all know that team is everything because, you know, that's how it is. Role of the vet changed 
perhaps over the years. I think historically we might have thought, um, right, we get the, get the animal out. If it won't stand up, perhaps we better get a vet here. And that's what many people have thought. Now I want the vet alongside me. I wouldn't want to go to a road tra traffic collision without a paramedic, and I wouldn't want to be at an animal rescue without a vet because they're so fundamental to this job, because they are going to provide me with the most important control measure, which is chemical control, perhaps, for the safety of everybody. Okay, so these are the things that they're going to be doing. Safety, triage, chemical control, pre-hospital care, and euthanasia, perhaps, because all animal rescues don't go well. Um, sometimes the animal is not a viable rescue, all right, and there's no good us going through all these dramatic rescues and bringing in helicopters and doing all the things that we can do as a rescue service than we would do for a human if at the end of it the vet's just going to put it down anyway and perhaps going to say, well, we actually put it through more trauma by actually rescuing it. You know, so viability is an important aspect of this. We need to understand, is it the right thing to do to rescue it in the first place? June 2008, we ran a conference because many farm rescue services were asking questions about this. What do we need to do to improve? So we threw it open, ran a conference. Rebecca and Tomas came over for that. It was a great day. And uh, many of the 150 people that were at that conference are still today engaged in the rescue initiative and moving it forward with everybody else. So that was a really, really um, important key milestone for us. And we meet um, three or four times a year. The Chief Fire Officers Association, which is the body that um, uh, basically disseminates best practice uh, for the UK Fire Service, said, set up a forum, get together and develop national standards, because we haven't got any. And then I don't know whether that's something that uh, you've got in your country, that is there is a, a body that disseminates best practice. They're the people that need to be making these decisions. They're the ones that need to be leading from the top uh, to move this on. Following that, we started running animal rescue specialist courses. So we have three tiers of, uh, of training, awareness, responder, and specialist. And the specialist is the person that has a greater understanding of what the vet can do for us, anatomy, why we do rescue techniques and the way that we do them. So we started running these courses, again, down in the New Forest in my little station. Um, and we teach the whole range of different techniques because it's all about tools in your toolbox. We set up scenarios. Now, it's very difficult with a mannequin to make, bring this to life, but you can bring it to life if you use real equine owners, and then you set up a scenario, and they're there with, the, with this mannequin horse wrapped up in barbed wire, and I'll tell you what, they get really, really emotional about it. We have them crying and, and the screaming and carrying on. They get so involved in it because they relate it to their animal. And uh, it's really, really important to have that dynamic because, again, command and control is what you need to establish uh, this scene. March 2010, we've now got generic risk assessments. You can have them, no problem, that's all right, easy. It's all electronic. That enables us to formulate standard operating procedures. That enables us to work smartly and safely at a rescue. We've got agreed ways of working. We've got roles for the different firefighters and responders that would go there. There's role descriptors to say what they will do, what their, um, what their role is and how involved in the situation they will be. So here we've got our level two responders. They're the ones that have got handling um, training and experience and they're the ones that have got uh, the rescue skills. And we've got our AR1 crew that are our logistics and we've got our safety officer in place. We've got our incident commander in place. We've got his, his um, specialist uh, tactical advisor and we've got our vet. They form the command team. This is where the vet sits in the command team. Bigger the instant, obviously, we might need to sectorise it, and we might need to have different sectors, we might even have a functional sector for vets. But all these things are now starting to be put into a procedural uh, format. So we get away from this scenario where we're winching up a thoroughbred horse up a rescue path. This is back in 2004, so it's a 10 metre rescue path. I'm winching it up, and we've got members of the public here. You know, and generally, wearing jobbers and know more about animal rescue than any of us sat in this room. Right, so they've all got an opinion. You go to a different yard, they'll have a different opinion, um, but that is the nature of, of the people that we were dealing with. And so we cannot accept the, the corporate liability of having a rescue going on with members of the public, ill-equipped, no training and no PPE. We've got an owner here who's covered in blood, she's been up close to the horse, she's grizzling, so that means that's going to convey uh, anxiety to the horse. And here we've got our vet scrabbling up this slope here, What's he got in his hand there? Is it a cigarette? No, it's his syringe. 
with the drugs to treat a 600 kilo horse. And this guy here, Stuart, he's been told that if this thing starts to kick off, he's to have, maintain his egress and he'll go backwards. And if he gets that shoved up his backside, yeah, he'll either die or he'll do four marathons in a row. <laughs> <laughs> so, this was a, a more recent incident, you know, cow stuck in a bit of mud. But look how our team are now. The team are dressed the part, you know, they've got their environmental protection suits on, they've got the roles, you know, they know their roles. We've got our incident commander, we've got our vet, we've got our animal rescue specialist. It's all starting to work just like it would at any other incident type that we go to. And that's the key to this. It is another incident type. This is nothing special. This is another incident type that we would attend. Drivers for change then. Well, the fire and rescue stand operating procedures that are developed now, well, that means that if there's a problem in someone's fire and rescue service and they haven't adopted those procedures and the judge says, well, let's have a look at what's considered best practice. Oh, look, the Chief Fire Officers Association say, all right, here's your standard operating procedure, here's your risk assessment, here's your task analysis, which informs the crew that goes there. Um, this, if they haven't done it, the chief's going to be in a lot of trouble, right, because he's got to justify why he put firefighters or other emergency responders in a dangerous situation that was identified as dangerous. He acknowledged he was sending them. He needs to change them. Animal Welfare Act, really another important one, because that places responsibility on us as rescuers for the animal's welfare. And if we make decisions that cause it to suffer, we could be held accountable. If we don't take action and an animal suffers, we may be held accountable under that Welfare Act. Very serious bit of legislation. You need to look at what yours is in this country and see whether that can be related, and you can use that as a lever. Health and Safety at Work Act, I've already said, we're going to send people out to a job. You've got to be protected. You've got to be trained. End of. It goes back to 1974. It's not a, not a recent thing. Fire Services Act, um, it's not a statutory duty to do animal rescue, but what it says is we can equip ourselves to deal with an eventuality that may cause a member of the public to become ill, injured or die, or a situation that affects the life and health of plants and animals. Okay, so the first bit for me is the important one, as the immediate rationale. This is a situation that may cause someone to be ill, injured or die, and we recognise within our integrated risk management plan that we're gonna res we have these type of incidents, we're going to respond to them, and animals, this is the important thing, it's not just about, oh, we've got a horse in a ditch or a cow in a slow pit. Animals will be a very much dynamically part of any incident you go to if they're present. You can have a generic risk assessment for a fire. We all know how to fight fires. You add animals to the mix, the dynamics change, the risks change to everybody. You need to have that knowledge. You need to be able to make those assessments. Um, also, the Farm Animal Welfare Committee reported to government in 2012 about planning for livestock emergencies in the UK. There is no joined up approach to livestock emergencies in the UK. The Fire and Rescue Service, they quote, has been you know, quite active in this field. However, most of our planning has been for single animal incidents, not the multi-agency joined up events that we're going to talk about tomorrow. So lots of drivers for change, lots of, lots of levers that we can use. And we must never, as Rebecca said right at the beginning, this is not about welfare. Uh, neglect, the RSPCA, all the things that we would consider. If you did a Google search now for animal rescue, most of the first, the top ten will all be welfare, donkey sanctuaries, Mrs. Tiki we can call them in a hedgehog sanctuary. <laughs> doesn't, you know. Our job is to remove an animal from a place of danger to a place of safety, firstly by the most appropriate method. I don't need to talk about that anymore. Rebecca's already mentioned that. But the overriding regard has got to be for the safety of ourselves and members of the public. Can't be any clearer than that. A few common incident types. Uh, this is a swimming pool job I had a little while back. Mischief was the horse. Mischief in the pool was the headline. It went everywhere. You might have seen it over here. Um, right, so firefighter, we've calmed the situation down. The swimming pools in the winter have cover on. Horse has gone down through the cover. Old lady's come out of the house to try and help it. She's been kicked. She's now inside being treated. Firefighter here, he's got a uh, head collar on, he's got a long lunge line attached to it so that if it does tear off across the pool, he pays it out and he then draws it back. He's always got head control. He's putting some food into it just to relax it, you know, good natural sedative. Vet arrives, there's a lot I could talk about this vet, I'm not going to. I'll just keep it simple. We had a discussion about sedation and um, it's, it's midwinter, no, it's a long story. It's a midwinter, he turns up in his shorts. That's, that's, I mean, that's, that should be a clue. Um, 
Add a discussion, this is the level of sedation I want, this is um, the level of stimulation that we might be causing, this is the technique I want to use to rescue this animal, um, this is how long it's going to take, what's your opinion on triage and that sort of thing. We had the discussion, he sedated it, uh, and then we put a sheet alongside of the bank there, the horse is nice and relaxed and calm, um, he held the head, we put a barrel configuration round and we just zipped it over the side. Traditionally, we'd have pumped the pool out, chucked a load of bales in there and tried to lead it up some ramshackle heap of junk which has an inherent danger attached to it. All right, we don't do that anymore. Uh, things can get a little bit more serious. Here is uh, human involvement. This is uh, two Frisian horses pulling a, a little buggy. An ATV started up in a side street, panicked the horse, they disappeared through the railings. There was a 30-foot drop into someone's garden below. This is the top horse hanging in the harness here and the next one is hanging uh, from that down here and the ladies, one was ejected and ended up over there, the other one was ejected and hit the um, stanchion of that um, trampoline, um, split her knee open and then she bounced back straight underneath this horse that was panicking and struggling. You know, so you don't have time to get a rescue team to a job like that you know, and go through the full procedures, but what you've got to understand with the teams that you send out as the initial response is they need to understand the hazards so that they can make an informed decision and we will take risks to save saveable human life. And I'm sure your rationale is exactly the same. We will take some risk under control conditions to save saveable property. Horses and other animals to us are saveable property if they're viable, okay? Um, so in this situation, they had to make some quick decisions to be able to remove that problem from that, that person to save her life. And the vet's job at the scene of that, put, kill those two horses. It wasn't rescue the horses, it was kill those two horses because of the, the nature of the incident. Uh, this is Flash Gordon in the cattle grid, Welsh Cobb cross Shire, cross Hanoverian, Princess Anne knows of this horse. And um, we're a few years along now. First person that went up to that horse, vet, intramuscular, sedative, we brought all our equipment in, anaesthetised it, and then cut it out of the cattle grid. The horse survived, no damage, apart from a small coronet damage around here, which was due to the nature of uh, going in there. Um, this horse stuck on a gate. The vet said, I'll twitch it, and you wriggle the gate down to Anton. <laughs> so, you can't wriggle that gate off of there. Twitching is a physical form of control. It is not, not good enough at a rescue because of the stimulation of all the things that are around it including us, and I always say, looking like a bunch of wasps and smelling like a bonfire. That is not calming to the large animal. You know, so that needed sedating and carefully cutting away. This is a deer that's been slung through the window of a car, killed the driver, haunch of it ended up in the boot, kids have been traumatised forever. Um, you know, that's the sort of stuff we go to. This is, my, so this is my form of sedation, any vets in the room? You know, so this, this highland cow with horns like that um, was uh, chucking her head around in this feeder, and so we've just got a haylage bell and just placed it on its head. It can't move then. <coughs> <coughs> Small animal rescue. Well, here we've got a swan that's crash landed on a roof, can't fly away because it can't get any sort of momentum. Um, here we've got a dog with its head stuck in the, in the decorative brickwork and we've got a deer stuck in a pit. Regular instant types for us. In the countryside, people would tend to resolve things in the cities, they tend to pick up the phone and want someone to come and help them. That's the nature of it. We don't send fire crews anymore. We just send one animal rescue specialist with the RSPCA and 80% of the time we resolve it without any further resources required and that causes um, well, considerable benefits for our officers who aren't then going out and having to look at jobs and then call fire engines in. Uh, and also it saves a lot of money. So any of you that are thinking about, oh, this is going to cost us money, there are ways of making this be cost effective. Cat in a window. Do you have UPVC windows out here where you can either open them normally or flap them so that you get this deep V, we get those. So this is a three-storey um, townhouse. Cat jumps for freedom, gets stuck, pinched halfway through the window. Many of them don't, don't survive. Some would say that you know, it's a cat, but I have to say the general public in the United Kingdom are so, so besotted with these cats, they're just members of the family, they will do anything in their power to rescue them from trees and buildings, that sort of thing. Dogs through ice, yeah, ice is when water, you know, gets very cold and it, on the lake, you know, you wouldn't have that problem out here. <laughs> you just put ice in your drinks. Um, silly people, throwing sticks with dog on the ice, ice, dog goes through the ice, oh dear, 
and then they go out and they try and rescue it. And then I think it was a quote in America, was it 96% of ice rescues are initiated by an animal? By an animal. Crazy. Every, every job that we go to involving animals on ice, there's a human willing to put themselves at risk. And you know, it's just crazy. So that's the small animal side of things. Just put that sheep up there. That's come from another part of England. Uh, if we think of the sheep, it's either got on there through some t uh, tomfoolery or um, the hillside extends right down to the roof line and it's got up there. But just look at this from a predatory aspect. Any of you that are farmers that know about stock, firefighters leaping out over here like a bunch of wolves. You know? <laughs> it's all about psychology. Transportation, we're going to cover... Um, a little bit more detail, the larger scale transportation, but this is a common thing for us. Here's the rear facing um, three and a half ton ladies box, I like to call them, and uh, the horse faces backwards to travel, and for some reason we're getting constant problems um, with horses that are going over the partition and either hanging out over the, out the back here or becoming totally wedged in there. That's a full on extrication. Right? That thing needs to be anaesthetised and you need to extricate it. There's no getting away from it. Um, so challenging, when Anton turned up that job, this thing was flailing around in mid-air and all that happened was that it got a leg over, the lady had panicked and gone for help and left the door open. They just see daylight, want to go. Loads and loads of stuff we can show you about that, I mean, we haven't got time for it. Um, road traffic collisions on our, on our motorways are very, very common. And uh, here's a scenario for you in the fire rescue service. Any of you in training, you know, you like to embellish things and say, well, yeah, we then have this exercise and then a plane crashes into it or a train crashes into it and we make all these fancy scenarios, shark infested custard and all that sort of stuff. Here we've got a chemical tanker and a car, a livestock transporter and another car into that. The driver of the livestock transporter was killed, the driver of the car was killed, the transporter did a 360, took out the Armco barrier and then the ramp door swung open, one cow was flung out onto the carriageway as it went around and the other five that were in that back compartment were jettisoned over the side of the um, viaduct. And then we had all sorts of problems. This was in, the, in Wales, but it was right on the border of jurisdictions. So you had fire brigades from either side, you had police from either side, you had an animal rescue team that wasn't being listened to, you had police marksmen up on the top of these vehicles with the red dots going all over the place because they were scared that other animals would come out. It was dreadful. Five minutes, okay, that's good. We've got five minutes left. Um, so moving forward, what we need uh, to, to continue this, we need firefighters trained to national standards. That's really quite important. But everyone needs to be trained to the same standard. Effective and appropriate veterinary intervention. It's no good leafing through the yellow pages and looking up AR Vark and down for, for the nearest vet because 80% of our vets are small animal vets. And you don't want a hamster vet at a large animal rescue. We need an efficient support network, including the hauliers, the knackermen, you know, all these people that help us, referral hospitals, dark gun operators, and we need informed responders with awareness of the problems involved with large animals. So it's not just about the rescuers knowing, it's about other agencies, and I'm going to talk tomorrow uh, a little bit about a, a large transport incident that I attended and how everyone needs to understand the implications of their actions at the scene and understand what we're trying to achieve. The future then, and this could be interesting from Mark's perspective because we've realised that the Fire and Rescue Service have moved forward and it's great, but that other areas of the rescue initiative need to be coordinated. And so what we've done is set up the British Animal Rescue and Trauma Care Association. Uh, I've set that up with my uh, veterinary professor, Josh, who's going to speak tomorrow. And this is an association providing advice, direction, training and accreditation to agencies involved in the rescue and trauma care of animals to maintain the professional standards and the competencies of those involved. And the primary objective is to safeguard the public. So this is going to be the umbrella. The way that it works is it's a hub. And all it is is a hub. It's a conduit. And it allows people to get together and to make corporate decisions. So feeding in to barter from the rescue services will be the Chief Fire Officers Association. They have an Animal Rescue Practitioners Forum, which is specifically for animal rescue. But there are other disciplines that are affected. Water rescue, rope rescue, confined space, all these other things that we've talked about this morning. So if we need a specific piece of work to be done, we're going to ask CFOA to provide us with an expert from their technical work stream that's relevant. Similarly with the vets, they've got the British Veterinary Association and their technical or their species divisions that sit under that. The British equine vets, the cattle vets, small animal vets, all those. So they're going to feed into it. And then we've got other responders like the police and the highways agency, the RSPCA, other non-government organisations that have um, an involvement in rescue to some degree. And then we've got our user groups, 
the horse industry, companion animals, farming and haulage. You know, so it's just a big cog to allow these, um, the, these strands to come together so that if we want to come up with best industry best practice, we can say hand on heart that that comes from the vets, the farm rescue, the police and all the others because they've all signed up to it. BARTA has a training committee and uh, we're developing standards now for vet training specifically at the moment uh, and then from the main players we will ask them to provide people for a standards committee so once we develop that we will then say we want your standards committee to sign it off and that's a done deal then. So, One very brief film just to finish off. Back in the early 1990s, it was really identified that animals posed a, a different risk to humans at a rescue. When animals are trapped, particularly large animals, they resort to natural instinct, which is flight or fight. So it's really not appropriate for people to try and intervene if an animal is trapped, because that animal will not see them as being there to help. We understand that as animals can't help themselves, people are going to have to intervene and if they haven't had the right training, haven't got the right equipment or knowledge, they are going to be placed in danger. And as a fire and rescue service, that's one of the main reasons for us existing. Animal rescue, up until quite recently, remained one of those situations where we were still going out, doing the best we could, improvising as best we could, but our decisions perhaps weren't coming from an informed position. Over the last few years, we've been developing our equipment, our techniques, our procedure and our knowledge about these scenarios and how we can deal with them in the most effective way. That's involved the Chief Fire Officers Association and very good cooperation with our veterinary associations. They've given us the understanding that we need to ensure that we have that knowledge and to ensure that the techniques that have been developed, they are in the best interest of not just safety for the rescuers but also the best interest of the welfare of that animal. We're in a really good position now because we have a common set of tools and common understanding throughout the UK Fire and Rescue Service to uh, determine the best uh, approach to the animal rescue. Whilst Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service have been at the forefront of animal rescue and are the UK lead, it's important to stress that everybody's on a journey. We're all learning every day and animal rescues will always be a challenge and animal incidents will always surprise us and therefore it's been so encouraging that fire and rescue services from around the country have joined together through the Animal Rescue Practitioners Forum, have engaged and have brought their experiences and their knowledge to the table because that's going to take animal rescue to the next level.